So Plaid is pretty neat. With one single set of APIs, your application can talk to thousands upon thousands of banks out there, which lets you do everything from, say, fund your own app accounts, to help your customers apply for loans, to, say, build some pretty swell personal financial apps. But of course, you can't do any of that until you first know how to talk to the Plaid API. So let's figure out how to do that on today's inaugural episode of Plaid Academy. So over the course of this video, we're going to do two things. First, we're going to get the official Plaid Quick Start application up and running so we can make some basic calls to the Plaid service and see what that's like. Then I'll give you a general overview of how it all works so that in the future, when you want to modify this code for your own custom application needs, you can do so with confidence. Now, unlike some simpler services where you might just say, stick an API key into a REST call in your browser and be done with it, a Plaid powered application is going to require both a client and a server component. Your users will be authorizing Plaid to talk to their financial institutions on the client side, but your application will primarily be talking to Plaid using server to server calls. So we're going to need to get both parts running to really see this in action. Now for this video, I'm going to be building the official Plaid quick start application for the web which will be using a React-powered front-end and a Node-powered back-end. Uh, don't worry too much if you're not an expert on um, either of these technologies. Honestly, I'm not either. Uh, but I am going to say that ideally, this shouldn't be your first time running NPM. OK, uh, enough chit-chat. Let's start building. So first off, before we get started with anything else, you're going to need a Plaid developer account, which you can sign up for over at dashboard.plaid.com. Um, I obviously already have one, but you should make sure you've created an account there too if you haven't done that already. Now, at the time of this recording, I am using node 16.13.1, which is the active LTS version. Uh, it's probably best if you have something similar. Um, oh, also, as a side note, I highly recommend using NVM to manage your different node versions, uh, which you can find here on their GitHub page. It's not an official Plaid product or anything. I just find it really useful if you switch node versions around a lot like I do. And uh, if you really get stuck configuring Node and can't seem to get this thing working, there's also a Docker version that you can try running instead, and you can find those instructions here. Uh, but personally, I'm going to go with the non-Docker version since I think it's a little easier for me to iterate on my code that way. OK, let's start by cloning the Git repository for our quick start. Uh, you can find the link here in our documentation, or you know, maybe just Google it. And uh, here it is. So I'm going to copy our repository URL. All right, next up, open a terminal window and navigate to your favorite folder for running sample apps. And uh, then I'm going to type git clone, paste in our repository, and then let's stick this into a Plaid quick start folder. Uh, by the way, heads up for all you Windows developers, uh, this repository uses symlinks. And I guess the way Git handles those is sometimes a little wonky on Windows machines. So you're going to want to use git clone with this core symlinks flag here to make sure those work properly. Once the code has been pulled over, we can jump into our folder here. And uh, we're going to want to copy this env example file over to .env. Now, this file contains some environment variables that our server code is going to use in order to properly initialize the Plaid connection. And I'll talk a little more about this shortly. Uh, but now, at this point, I think we can open up this directory in our favorite code editor. I'm going to use VS Code, but you know, you do you. All right, so first up, let's open up that env file. We're going to need to fill this out with all the correct values so that we can pass along the right settings to our server code. Now, these top two are probably the most important. We're going to need a client ID and a secret to make sure that our server application is allowed to talk to Plaid. And where do we get those? From the Plaid dashboard. So let's head on over to dashboard.plaid.com. I will click on Team Settings up here and go to the Keys section. Uh, so this client ID is just an identifier for our organization, and uh, we can copy that in here. And then you'll probably have one, two, or maybe three choices of secrets, depending on what environment you want to use. So uh, let's talk about those. Sandbox here is basically used for development purposes. You have nearly unlimited use of all the Plaid products for free, but you're not going to be touching any real data. All the data you're reading in will be fake, and you won't actually be affecting any user data, which you know, is probably a good thing while you're still working out all the bugs in your application. Development is used for testing out your application against real data, but with a small pool of trusted testers or maybe just your dev team or something. Uh, like sandbox mode, it's free to use, but you're usually limited to basically 100 logins. Upgrading your account to development does take about one business day. You have to fill out a form that tells us a little about yourself, but then after you get approval, you should be able to use it. 
Uh, also, not all of Plaid's products will be enabled by default. You might need to perform a few additional steps to enable some of these products in the development environment. And then the production environment is when you want to use Plaid's products out in the real world. You have access to real data and there aren't any limits like there are in development, but you are going to start paying for the products you're using. Now, approval for this does also take a couple of business days and you'll need to tell us a little more about your company, how you're planning on using the Plaid API and so on. And yes, you need to set up billing too at this point. So for our sample application, we're going to use Sandbox. It's free to use. There's no setup time, uh, but we will only be working with fake data. So I'm going to copy the secret key here into my environment variable. Um, and I do want to emphasize here that this secret key really should be kept secret. Like anybody who gets access to your client ID and secret uh, might be able to make Plaid requests on your behalf, which is a security risk, not to mention the fact that you might start getting charged for all those API calls. So for starters, never put your secret in a client application, whether that's on mobile or the web. This should only be saved on your server and used for server to server calls. Also, uh, before going into production, I would look into storing this a little more securely than just as an environment variable. Most cloud providers now have some kind of secrets manager to store these, which might be a good option to consider. And for crying out loud, never show these things in plain text in a screencast. That would just be a terrible, terrible idea. Better. Uh, you'll notice that down here, we've also selected Sandbox for the environment we're using. Uh, that determines what endpoints our server will be calling. Uh, make sure this matches up with the secret that you're using. As for the rest of these entries, uh, this one up here lists the products that we want our app to use. Plaid has a number of different services or products that you can talk to, like liabilities to get data around a user's loans, or investments, which gets you investment data. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, all these products are enabled for us already in the sandbox environment. But as a general rule, it's a good idea to only list out those products that your app will actually be using. Uh, for one thing, you might get charged for these when your application goes live. Uh, and for another, Plaid will only list banks that support all the products you specify. So uh, if your favorite bank isn't showing up, um, it might be because you've listed too many products. So right now we have auth, which will get you information like account and routing numbers, as well as transactions, which will give you a list of recent transactions from our user's bank. Uh, let's also add identity here, just for fun. Uh, this will give us some information about our user's identity as verified by their bank. We have our country codes down below. Uh, you should include all the countries where your application will be going live. Uh, and then down here is where you would specify a redirect URI. Uh, this is used for OAuth purposes and something you're going to need to do to support certain larger banks as well as most banks in Europe. Um, but I am going to save that for a separate video. OK, with that, we should be all set up here. I will save this file and uh, we should be ready to run our application. Let's open up a terminal and uh, we'll start up our server first. I'll navigate to our node directory and run npm install. Once that's done, I can call npm start, and uh, that should get our server running on port 8000. OK, next, let's open up a new terminal window and get our front end working. Uh, I'll go into our front end directory here and uh, do another npm install. Uh, this one will take a little longer, so uh, I'll see you in a minute or two. OK, we're back. And now I can also run npm start to set up our React development server. And this will get our client application running on localhost port 3000. So go ahead and open up a web browser to point to that address uh, if one doesn't pop up for you automatically. But in my case, it just, it just showed up. And if everything is working right, you should have a screen that looks like this with a nice little launch link button. So if we click this, we can go through the process of authorizing Plaid to talk to our favorite financial institution. So uh, let's do that. So I'll click Continue, and then I can select a bank. Now, don't be afraid to select your favorite bank here. Remember, we're in the sandbox environment, so you won't actually be talking to any of these places for real. Plaid does provide a number of like special case banks for testing specific use cases, uh, like these Platypus banks here and some others that I think just begin with Plaid. But I don't need any of these right now. So I'm going to go ahead and pick, uh, let's just say Chime. Now, the username and password will always be the same when you're in the sandbox environment. The username is user underscore good, and the password is pass underscore good. And you can see that information down here in a little status bar that I totally missed the first dozen times I did this thing. Depending on the financial institution you pick, you might also be asked to provide a two-factor auth code. If that happens, just type in 1234. Huh, funny, that's the same combination as my luggage. Now, once that's all done, you should get a screen that looks a little like this where you'll be able to make a bunch of different calls against the Plaid endpoints just by clicking this Send Request button. So uh, in fact, let's do that. Auth here will get you a list of account and routing numbers for checking and savings accounts, which you might need for tasks like transferring funds. 
Uh, transactions will get you a list of recent transactions. Great if you're looking to build some budgeting software. Identity will get you information about the user as verified by the bank. This is great if your user is, say, applying for a loan or adding money to your app, and you want to make sure they really are who they say they are. Balance will get you a list of account balances updated in real time. This is useful if you're building like a peer-to-peer -peer payment app and you want to make sure your user has enough money in their bank account to cover a transaction. Investments uh, shouldn't be here since we didn't include it in our product list. Um, honestly, this was a bug in our quick start that has since been fixed. So I don't think this should even show up in your app by the time uh, you're watching this video. So uh, let's just all pretend like we didn't see this and move on, shall we? Sounds good. There are also several other product endpoints that aren't listed here, um, and that's because we didn't include them as products when we initialized our application. Finally, down below, we have a couple of endpoints that give you like some meta information about your user and their connection. Uh, this item get endpoint will tell you a bit about the financial institution that you're connected to. And then account slash get will tell you about all the accounts that are stored at this institution. Now, you might notice that this looks almost the same as what you get back from the balance endpoints. And that's true when we're working with our fake data. But in practice, this data is going to be several hours old, while balance will have more real-time information. So this is a pretty good first step, right? Like we've got our sample application up and running. And you know, you're free to start messing with the code and seeing what else you want to do with it. But if you're willing to hang out with me a little longer, let's see if I can explain to you exactly what's going on here and how our application is now able to get back this data from these financial institutions. So before we go any further, let me define two terms that the Plaid team likes to throw around a lot that sound kind of generic, but actually mean very specific things. First, an item is basically a login to a bank or financial institution. Items usually have one or more accounts associated with them. Uh, for instance, when I asked Plaid to connect with Chime, that created a single item, the login to that bank, but then it got back several accounts, a savings account, a checking account, and so on. Second, link is the name of the client-side widget thingy that Plaid provides, which allows your user to sign into their bank through Plaid. This means that you, as an app developer, don't need to deal with handling any usernames or passwords directly, and we handle the majority of the UI tasks for you, including dealing with multi-factor auth and, and all that fun stuff. You are able to customize the look of this a bit in the Plaid dashboard, but you know that's probably a topic for a future video. So with that, let's talk about what happens when a user authorizes Plaid to retrieve their information from a financial institution, because there's a lot of moving parts here. First, you have your client application, maybe on a mobile device or on the web. Uh, inside of there is Link, the client-side widget that does a lot of the heavy lifting around the UI. Then you've got your application server that's sitting up in the cloud somewhere. And then there's Plaid service. And finally, there's the financial institution you're trying to connect to. So in the first half of the process, we need your client to talk to Plaid using Link. The problem is that we can't necessarily trust your client. You might say you're you know, app ABC, but how do we know for sure? Like, remember, you're not allowed to store that secret in a client-side application. But what you can do is have your server talk to the Plaid service directly. Uh, this is a server-to-server -server call where it's safe to pass along your client ID and your secret, which means that we can verify it's actually you. And so your server will ask for something called a Link token. Uh, this is essentially a one-time password that's valid for about four hours. If you send that token up to your client, then your client can talk to the Plaid service directly by passing along this link token. Plaid can then examine this link token and be pretty confident that you are who you say you are. So step one, your client is going to talk to your server to request a link token. And then in step two, your server is going to talk to Plaid and ask for a link token. Again, sending across its client ID and secret so we know it's really you. You're going to get back your link token, which you can then send back up to your client. Your client application is now ready to open up Link, passing along this token. Plaid will verify that the token is valid, and then it will start the Link process. Now, at this point, your user, through the Link widget, is going to sign into their bank account so they can share their data with your application. Uh, now, the specifics here depend a bit on the bank and their level of sophistication. And like I said, in the future, you're going to be seeing more OAuth flows where Link will actually take the user to their bank's login page to complete this process. But by the end here, Plaid will have some kind of token or set of credentials that it can use to connect to this institution in the future. And uh, it might also start gathering information that it thinks your application might need, like recent transactions. And this is basically the point where we've created an item. And that's great, but we need your application to be able to retrieve this information in the future without having your user go through this login step every time. 
we need to somehow get some kind of unique password or access token to your application so you can request this information moving forward. So here's what happens next. So step four, Plaid sends back a token to your client. Uh, this is a pretty short-lived token, one that I think lasts about 30 minutes or so. Uh, the reason it's so short-lived is because once it's on your unsecured client, it's considered dirty. It's a lot more susceptible to being exposed or hacked. Uh, but I guess dirty token didn't meet with our branding guidelines, so we call this a public token instead. So from there, we move on to step five. Your client sends this public token over to your application server, um, basically as soon as your client receives it. And then in step six, your application server sends this public token back to Plaid, along with its client ID and secret, of course. And then after verifying that this public token is a valid token and was designated to be used with your application and you know, hasn't been used before, Plaid will create an access token. It'll associate it with this specific item and send that back to your application server so that you can access this item in the future. So from this point on, when you need to access this user's data from Plaid, you're gonna make those calls from your application server. Your server will pass along your application's client ID and secret so that we know who's making this request. And then you'll also pass along this access token so we know what information to get. That means it's up to you to store this access token in a database somewhere and make sure that it's tied only to this specific user. And you should treat this with the same level of security as you would any other sensitive financial information. In fact, maybe even more so in that you don't want this to ever leave your server. I know our sample app shows you this access token in the browser, but that's just for demonstration purposes. Don't do this in an actual application. So now that we understand these steps, let's take a whirlwind tour of the quick start code and see if we can understand how all of this is being implemented. I'll warn you, we are gonna get a little more reacty here, um, but I'll try to explain anything that seems too weird if you're like a iOS or you know, vanilla JavaScript developer. All right, let's look at the code. Okay, so here in our app TSX file, in this generate token call is step one. We're asking our server to go and get a link token for us. Note that all these calls to like slash API are to our local application server, that thing on node that's running on port 8000, not the Plaid API. Again, with the exception of the link widget, our web client basically never talks to the Plaid service directly. Now you'll notice this method to create a link token is basically called when we start up our app. And you know, that's fine for a demo application where like we know you're gonna be wanting to start the link process right away. In a real application, that might generate a bunch of unneeded network calls and maybe some expired tokens. You probably don't wanna request a link token until you're pretty sure the user actually wants to run link. Like maybe when they visit a connect my bank screen. So this call will be received on the server side in our node slash index.js file. So uh, let's open that up. Actually, uh, first thing I'll point out here is that in this section here, we're defining some of these variables like uh, the Plaid client ID and the secret from that env file that we configured way back at the beginning of this video. And then you'll see here, we're configuring our Plaid API client, that's the library that's actually gonna talk to Plaid, to point to the sandbox environment and then send across our client ID and secret in the header of every network request that we make to Plaid. By adding those headers here, we don't need to worry about adding these things in as arguments for every future call. They'll just be added automatically by our library. Okay, so down here in our create link token call, uh, you can see we're getting ready to request the link token. Uh, you can see we're adding in some code to configure exactly what we'll be using this connection for. And then we make a call to Plaid by using this link token create call. And then assuming everything looks okay, we can send it back to the client. So if we jump back into our client code, I can log the data that we receive here. Uh, by the way, for those of you not familiar with React and wondering what this like dispatch call is, uh, I guess the overly simplified explanation is that we're modifying various key value pairs on a global object that we're able to access throughout our application. Uh, so this call here is basically taking the link token that we got back from our server and setting it as the link token property of this kind of global variable that we refer to elsewhere as our context. For a React purist, I probably didn't quite do that justice, but hopefully that'll be enough to get by. Uh, so at this point, we can move on to step three, and that's passing this link token along to the link client library. And that all happens here in the link slash index TSX file. We're embedding that link token we just set with that dispatch call inside of this configuration object, along with the on success callback that we wanna call when our user signs in. Uh, that's defined above, and I'll get back to that in a minute. And so now we're passing that object here to use plaid link, a special React-only method that configures link for us. 
Um, because the way React works, uh, this gets called multiple times, but you know that, that's okay, no, no harm there. So now what's interesting about this use plaid link method is that it returns an object that itself contains a couple of functions and a couple of values. Uh, we're using some JavaScript destructuring to grab two things that we're interested in, a ready Boolean to tell us if we're ready to call link and an open function. That is the function to call when the user clicks the launch link button. And you can see we sort of uh, make that call down here. Now, once the user's done, link is gonna call that on success function that you passed in earlier, which we've defined up here. And the one parameter it's gonna pass into that on success function is the short-lived public token. So here's step four, we're getting back our public token from link. This then brings us to step five, sending this token to our server so it can exchange it for a real access token. And that's this uh, set token call here. And so you can see we're passing along this token to our application server with this set access token endpoint. Um, honestly, I think a more accurate endpoint name might be something like, hey, exchange this public token for an access token, but I could see how that gets kind of wordy. So uh, we'll just go with the old name. So now we can jump back into our application server and here's our set access token call that receives this public token. And this is where step six happens. Our server makes this call to item public token exchange, where we exchange it for a real access token. And that's what we get back here in the response from this call. Notice that we are actually sending this information back to our client here in our response. And again, I should remind you, that's really only for demonstration purposes. There's no reason to ever really send this access token to your client. Um, as for that item ID, uh, it's really just another identifier for this access token. Uh, you would generally use it in cases where you might search your logs for this item, or you're talking to like Plaid customer support, and you want to reference the access token without having to send across anything too confidential. You'd use the item ID instead. You can also see that we're simply saving this access token in a variable that's kept around in memory. And you know, that's fine for now, but in a real application, you'd want this saved in a database linked to a specific user ID and you know, something you would retrieve on behalf of a signed in user after verifying this user's auth token or what have you. So now we're ready to talk to the Plaid service. And at this point, well, I suppose it really is just pinging a REST endpoint. Uh, here, let me walk you through one of these. Let's say I want to see some recent transactions for this particular user. So the logic to make that call on the client is contained here in this endpoint component. Again, this gets into some pretty React specific logic, but all this really is is a fancy way to make a call to our server and then display the data that gets returned in a nicely formatted way. Specifically, it's gonna call API slash transactions in our application server. And uh, if we jump into our server code, here's that endpoint. And you can see that we're making that call by calling the transactions get method in our library and then passing in any other parameters that we might need to send in that configs object. Um, in this case, that's gonna be a start date, an end date, a maximum number of items to return, and most importantly, that access token. Remember, our application's client ID and secret are already sent in every call we make because of that step above when we configured our client library headers. And what we get back from this call is a big old data object, which we can send back to our client as a JSON object. Once it gets back to our client, we're just using some combination of JavaScript and React magic to display it to the user in a pretty way. Again, don't worry about this too much if you don't know React. Basically, we're taking our data passing it through this transformation function, which gives us back a set of key value pairs that we're then using to fill out the rows of a table that gets displayed. In fact, you know what, just so you can see what's going on here, let's skip all this fancy React stuff. Back in my app TSX script, I'm just gonna add in a simple function here to call our server where we're hitting the same endpoint and just logging our stringified results to the console. Let's uh, add in a button down here to call that function, and then we can uh, revisit our front page, uh, I'm gonna reload here and uh, as I'm signing in again, you can now see that all those steps that we defined are being logged in our JavaScript console. And uh, here's our button down here. And you can see that, you know, basically once we remove all this React fanciness, we're just making a simple call to our server and getting back some JSON. We could even recreate that same call our server library makes to Plaid by just using a not so simple curl call. It looks a little something like this. So you can see here, I'm uh, hitting our sandbox endpoints. Here's where I'm passing in our client secret and our client ID. Uh, here's where I'm passing in our access token, which I you know, just copied from here, as well as asking for just the three most recent transactions. And if I were to run this, I get back the data I need from Plaid in convenient JSON form. And yeah, I've probably violated about three different security practices by making a call this way instead of like from my app server, but you know, I'm in sandbox mode and this is sometimes helpful for development or debugging purposes.
Oh, and if you're wondering how I knew exactly what arguments to include in this curl call, um, our reference docs are a good place to, to find all that information. Uh, that's basically what I used here, just uh, by going to the appropriate web page and selecting curl in our dropdown to, to see the sample code. So there you go. Those are the basics for getting started with Plaid in your application. Uh, there's a lot more, obviously, that I could talk about, but I think we all agree that this video has gone on for quite long enough. So uh, for now, I encourage you to check out the documentation. It's pretty good. And, you know, fool around with the sample application that you just built. There's probably some fun things you can do if you just play around with the code. And uh, hey, while you're here, why not consider subscribing to our YouTube channel so you can find out when new tutorials become available. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you around and uh, happy platting. Is that, is that a real word? Are we allowed to say that? We don't, I, I don't know, I'm new here. <laughs>